what the movement helps promote is an understanding of how deeply rooted within proper Islam love is indeed because it's rooted in a love for God and therefore love for humanity and love of the planet and all of the actions and activities of Hizmet help galvanize that kind of an understanding. I have consistent ideally I'm Ori Saltes. I teach at Georgetown University theology, art history, some politics, history, philosophy, across disciplines. Particularly in the world after 9-11, which is a world in which the West, the Judeo-Christian and particularly, well, no, the Judeo-Christian West became more aware of Islam than really I think it had been since the time of the Crusades, but also aware of Islam in an unfavorable way because of what 9-11 was all about. The Hizmet movement is arguably the most important antidote to the poison that grew out of that moment. And it's an antidote which functions just by being what it is and doing what it does. It's an antidote that will take a generation to have full effect. We can't be naive and we can't be um, surprised that it will take that long. But that's what it is. The, the services that his met provides again and again and again, so willingly, so cheerfully, over such a wide range of the globe, from educational institutions to social services to the kind of friendship dinners which give people an opportunity to sit together, to eat together, to talk together. And that's another thing, by the way, that we humans tend to have in common with each other. You sit and you drink and you eat and you become more comfortable talking as well rather than sitting around a table with nothing but papers and pens in front of us. We sit around a table with a lot of good food in front of us and it just lends a, a light and more relaxed atmosphere to the discussion that goes on. So all of this is, is, is essential to pushing toward a better future and it's essential for recreating the image in the non-Muslim world of what Islam is all about. But I have to say I remember when, in the immediate aftermath of 9-11, when Mr. Bush, who was desperate for something to say, made a comment about Islam as a religion of love. I, I don't know whether to laugh or cry. Islam is not a religion of love. Neither is Judaism, neither is Christianity. None of these are religions of love. They're religions whose understanding of God promotes love, but like every form of faith, they can be and they are habitually turned and twisted and torn by practitioners who don't see the love, who see the anger, who see the war, who see the aggression. And Islam is no different from other forms of faith in offering love, but it has had a history, as Christianity has had a history, as Judaism has had its own history of violence, of anger, and not only of love. What the movement helps promote is an understanding of how deeply rooted within proper Islam love is indeed because it's rooted in a love for God and therefore love for humanity and love of the planet and all of the actions and activities of Hizmet help galvanize that kind of an understanding. It strikes me that the most common characteristics of the individuals I've met who are affiliated with Hizmet institutions, particularly schools of course, is um, one, they're, they're, they're searching in a, in a spiritual sense. They're both spiritual and they're spiritually searching. And when I say searching, it's not that they're trying to figure out what form of faith to follow. It's rather how most effectively to follow their form of faith. How do I most effectively serve God? I find that 
as a, a common motif. Mind you, this isn't up front. This isn't something that, well, the first time I meet someone his met, they start talking about God. On the contrary, it's only after I've gotten to know someone, and maybe I bring that subject up, that I get that sense. So as much as they are searching for how can I most serve God, God isn't what's on their, on their lips all the time. It's what they're doing which is on their lips. How can we most effectively serve our students? Secondly, there is consistently uh, in everyone I've met involved with these schools and the movement at large a kind of, I want to say, radical humility, a certain fundamental calm, a certain sweetness of personality is something that I have consistently encountered in my encounters uh, with the teachers and the administrators involved with the Hizmet inspired schools and a kind of dedication that means that they will go not just 100% but 150% in favor of what their students need in order for their students to become more well-rounded human beings. There are two features in particular about the mystical experience and one sees this across the spectrum of mysticisms whether it's Jewish, Christian, Muslim, what have you and one certainly sees it in Sufism that um, feed I think also into Hoja Fendi's thinking and that inform the Hizmet movement that derives from his thinking and those two features in particular are one that the goal of the mystic is to become one with God, is to be filled with God. And the mystic, in order to do that, has to empty him or herself of self. If there's too much of me in the way, there's not enough space for God, or at least I can't be filled with God. So by definition, a mystic has to put his or her ego completely aside in order to embrace God and be embraced by God. And when that happens, of course, you can say in a fundamental way that God and the mystic become one. God who is the beloved whom the mystic seeks as the lover becomes or is the lover seeking the mystic who is the beloved and the love that is between them and the beloved and the lover all become one. They become indistinguishable from each other. We see that in the Sufi tradition beginning with Rabia and carrying forward to Ibn Arabi and Rumi and many, many others and certainly we see it expressed in what Hoja Fendi writes about. So if he is inspired by that, and if others are inspired by his being inspired by that, then it's very logical and it's very reasonable that I will encounter, as I have, so many people involved with the Hizmet movement who seem to exhibit that kind of lack of ego. I don't need the credit because I'm not doing it for myself. I'm doing it for God. Or I'm doing it to improve the world, which is the same as doing it for God. So given the, the importance of this emptying oneself of self to be filled with God, given the way in which ideally God and the mystic, the lover and the beloved, are interchangeable and the love between them is all part of one phenomenon, there's an inherent logic in my finding in the people whom I encounter who are involved with Hizmet, who are inspired by Gulen, who is inspired by Sufism, that they will be not egoless, but ego shunting and ego shunning. They don't need and they don't want credit for what they're doing. They're doing what they're doing for God. They're doing what they're doing for the world. The second mystical feature is that if I am to be filled with God, and as a consequence, I need to be egoless, then my goal cannot be to be filled with God. My goal is to be filled with God so that I am transformed. And when I come back from that mystical experience, I help transform the world around me. I benefit others. That's my ultimate goal. Not to become enlightened, but to become enlightened so that I can help others. And again, that kind of inspiration toward Hoj Effendi from mysticism in general, from Sufism in particular, is then expressed very logically by the Hizmet movement. It is all about individuals who strive to help those around them and not to do something for themselves.
what has been going on in Turkey in the last six or eight months, but arguably in the last several years, is of course approaching the tragic. I think that Hoca Fendi initially supported the current prime minister because he believed that they shared certain values in common, and that's how it appeared initially, I suppose. And it has struck me that if there has been a change, if, it, the, the, the most obvious change is that Mr. Erdogan has either shifted away from those values or perhaps it was a matter of taqiyya and he never had those values in the first place. But that's neither here nor there. The point is that, um, you know, Syed Nursi said, save me from there, this, that, and one of the things he says, save me from, is being political, is being part of the political world, because he well understood how corrupting it can be. And um, there's a kind of, for me, tragic irony to Mr. Erdogan's accusations against Hoca Fendi and against the movement. He speaks about a, a, a parallel party, or he speaks about their involvement in undercutting him. And of course, from where I sit and from what I see, that's not true at all. On the contrary, what Hizmet has been all about within Turkey is building up Turkey in all the positive ways. And by that I mean in terms of the values that Hoca Fendi and the movement stand for. I mean in terms of helping others. I mean in terms of altruism. I mean in terms of education, social services, finding a way to be in the world so that you can interact and engage in a positive way with everybody and not just people like yourself in your village or in your town, in your country, in your religion, in your ethnic group, what have you. So it's a very kind of tragic turn of events. I have to say, and uh, this is in part based on my reading of Hoca Fendi, we're all tested. And as, as painful as I must imagine this is for Hoca Fendi, at the same time, he recognizes, I have full confidence, that this is a kind of test. And that's the kind of message I imagine that he is also spreading among those inspired by him in the Hizmet movement. This is a kind of test, and it's a test that will be passed. It's a test that will be passed not by rising to the bait that Mr. Erdogan would like the movement to rise to, go to the streets, become violent. Because in a way, that would make it easier for him to say, you see, I told you so, to the Turkish people. But the Hizmet people remain calm, they remain kind, they remain humble, they remain engaged in their Hizmet-esque activities. And that's got to be increasingly frustrating for the prime minister. I would think that within the larger structure of Turkish society, both today and going back through the last, say, 20, 25 years or so, the two kinds of individuals and groups who would be most critical of Hoca Fendi and of the Hizmet movement are, on the one hand, the Islamists, for reasons earlier in this discussion that came up, which is that their view of what Islam is supposed to be is, is so narrow and the notion of engaging with non-Muslims, engaging in interfaith, intercultural, interracial dialogue is something that I don't think offends them as much as scares them. And as I suggested earlier, my suggestion to them would be look deeper into your own heart and your own soul and look deeper into the text of the Quran itself with respect to how one engages. And the other side of that, the other group, would be the secularists. And I understand from both sides what they fear. If the Islamists feel, fear Hoja Fendi's over-engagement of non-Muslims, the secularists fear that he's the Ayatollah Khomeini, that he is an Islamist who ultimately is unleashing a movement that will dispossess Jews and Christians and secularists and atheists and Hindus and everybody else of their rights to be as they are. But as I see him through his writings and through all of the people I've met who are involved with and inspired by him, that's not where it is at all. It is that if they happen to be Muslim, that doesn't mean that as Muslims they don't fully acknowledge, embrace, not just tolerate, but embrace the legitimacy of the various non-Muslim forms of faith they encounter and whose practitioners they encounter because they recognize that ultimately we're all part of a phenomenon that has one source and that if we are to assist that source 
in turning our world into a better one, then all of those different aspects of that one phenomenon have to interface in a positive kind of way. There has to be an, an emphasis on education, and that's clear in Hoja Fendi's writings. It's clear, first of all, because he many times makes the comment that it's all about our children. They're the future, and we have to invest in our children above all, and that means educating them above all. Within Islam, the, the very word itself means peace, right? And so I think uh, Hizmet is really uh, an instrument of peace, uh, as an instrument of going into our broken world, trying to make relationships happen, and in that sense, bringing about peace.